Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Today's seminar speaker is Dr. Whitney Cranshaw from Colorado State University, who we are co-hosting with the entomology department today. Dr. Cranshaw completed his bachelor's degree from Hampshire College in Massachusetts and his master's and PhD from the University of Minnesota. Currently, he is professor of entomology and uh, extension specialist in the Department of Bioagricultural Sciences and Pest Management at CSU. His research is focused on integrated pest management, and he recently discovered and described a, a disease known as thousand cankers disease, which is resulting in die-offs of black walnut trees. <coughs> Today, Dr. Cranshaw will be discussing ch challenges and opportunities for pest management of medical marijuana in Colorado. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Whitney Cranshaw. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I really do work on other stuff than this. This is kind of a side project, and uh, I'm here actually to talk about the Thousand Cankers uh, deal tomorrow in uh, a workshop in Wisconsin. But um, while I'm here, I could talk about this. Now, as of this point, I'm no longer with Colorado State University. You'll see there's nothing, there won't be anything from Colorado State University on this. Uh, I cannot talk about this subject as an employee of CSU. I have to talk about it as a private individual, the lawyers, because we accept federal money. From so, I'm on annual leave now, uh, so for the for the next hour and a half. Um, anyway, just a little background on this. In in uh, our our state, Colorado, where I'm from, uh, a couple things have uh, happened over the past few years related to cannabis as a crop. Uh, in 2000, way back in 2000, the state passed a uh, uh, constitutional amendment that allowed for medical marijuana to uh, be. Uh, allowed in the state and provided some provisions. Now, not too much really happened with this until about 2007, 2008, and then uh, it became quite a big uh, industry. But it, it allowed uh, uh, usage uh, of cannabis for patients with written medical pr uh, permission. That's the way we've been uh, for several years now. However, uh, a second uh, amendment was passed in November 2012, uh, Amendment 64, which allowed for the um, production and sale, commercial sale, of recreational marijuana, not just medical patients. You didn't have to have uh, written permission anymore. Uh, established regulations on its production and sale. It set taxes. Uh, and also, at the same time, industrial hemp, which would be uh, used for fiber and seed, was also allowed to be grown in the state according to Colorado's state constitution. Um, and at the same time, the, this is a map of uh, laws re related to marijuana uh, possession and growing and medical marijuana and the like throughout the country. At the same time, Washington state also passed a similar uh, constitutional amendment. So there's two states now that have uh, in the state constitution that allow the use, according to state law, that uh, you can produce cannabis for uh, various purposes. Um, now, let me just back up uh, or give a little more background since a lot of you aren't familiar with this. Uh, when we're talking about uh, 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 cannabis, uh, we're usually talking about two species, or two putative species anyway, uh, that are grown uh, prim primarily for psychoactive compounds. And the two uh, are cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. This is more of a Himalayan area, uh, Indian, uh, Indian subcontinent uh, origin uh, species. And these two uh, plants hybridize readily and uh, What's in the, uh, what, when people are, are selling these products, uh, these are often one, the other, or uh, uh, hybrids of, of the two. And they have different compounds that are related with each species. And anyway, so you get lots of different things happening. And by the way, an excellent, if you want to get up to speed really quickly on what has happened with uh, the, the development of cannabis as, as a crop for psychoactive compounds, read the chapter in Botany of Desire. It's a great chapter. Uh, it's got, you know, there's, there's chapter on apples, there's chapter on potatoes, there's chapter on tulips, and chapter on cannabis. And that's a great chapter. So it'll get you right up to speed. Amazing things have been done on the crop uh, under, the, you know, under, under the radar, uh, illegally, but they've been going on for decades. Um, also, there is uh, this issue with hemp. Hemp is the same species. It's just it is a cultivar that has low levels of uh, the uh, psychoactive compounds, and it has it's grown for fiber or sometimes seed. 
So hemp was also allowed under the uh, regulation. I'm not going to talk about hemp. To me, I mean, there's a lot of people interested in hemp, but as I say, you know, I mean, t the niche is, is going to be fairly small. It's going to be difficult to grow it in Colorado. As soon as they legalize it in, in Iowa, you'll be able to grow it like a tree, uh, whereas we have to irrigate it. So um, anyway, but people think we'll probably make some money for the first couple of years for seed, if nothing else, and then you guys will take it over when you legalize it. Um, now, federal laws are in conflict with state laws on this, as you may well be aware. Uh, marijuana in ca cannabis is, we're talking about uh, marijuana, recreational marijuana, medical marijuana, is uh, uh, classified as a Schedule I controlled substances uh, by, under uh, Federal Drug Enforcement Act. Uh, um, and it is in the same, the other things that are in Schedule One would be heroin, LSD, peyote, uh, methoqualone, ecstasy, these are all Schedule One drugs. So according to DEA, these are all equally bad. Schedule Two drugs, which are a little further down, would be the opiates, all the amphetamines, and all the things that are uh, destroying the U.S. Um, right now. Uh, now, the way it's to work under state law, when we're talking about the uh, cannabis that's uh, recreational marijuana, medical marijuana, it is, re it is only allowed as an indoor crop. You cannot grow it outdoors in, in our state. Other states have different laws on it, but this is, we're talking now strictly an indoor crop, and this allows some control over access to it, and, um, uh, uh, and again, so you would not be seeing people growing fields of this anyway. It's all grown indoors in uh, confined situations. Um, it is propagated either by seeds or by cuttings, mostly by cuttings. This is a crop that is generally uh, produced by cuttings because you get a certain strain that has certain qualities and you want to uh, reproduce it. So that's the primary way it's, it's cultivated. But you can grow it from seed. Um, production size varies. Uh, you know, many people have small, uh, they might have some growing in their, their people can have, grow six plants themselves now, so it would be in their closet. Uh, or they could be large size, and, and now, right now, we have huge greenhouse operations ramping up to grow this. So this is, there's a lot of money is just pumping in right now, and it's going to be huge in terms of. I think we're going to be way over. We're, we're a little short in the beginning, but they're going to be way more than I think they can consume in a, in a year. Uh, everybody, everybody's jumping on this. Um, Cultivation of this crop is extremely intensive, extremely expensive. It involves a lot of lights, it involves a lot of equipment to get the water, the soil, everything, uh, but it also has a big return. I mean, you can grow, up, you can grow a single plant that uh, could retail for over a thousand bucks, uh, a plant you know, this big, take up that much space. There's a lot of money involved in this. Um, but uh, it is, is uh, uh, high value, very high value crop. I don't think there's any crop you can think of that's higher value than, than what this will be. Intense lighting, and, uh, lots of uses of fans. Uh, uh, again, this is indoor grown and very intense light. In fact, the lights may also may be on for 24 hours a day, at least in the beginning. When, you, when you're growing at the vegetative stage, you're, you have lights on most all of the day, and then there'll be, uh, to grow this, you turn the lights off for uh, usually four or five days, and that triggers it to go um, produce flowers. So, um, some growers utilize uh, hydroponics, and this can be grown hydroponically. I will point out uh, a little bit later, it's probably really stupid to do this with this crop because you'll get nailed by root rots, uh, pythium root rot that will just uh, uh, whack you if it, once you get it in it and then you're permanently uh, ruined. Um, also, what we are growing uh, is the female reproductive flower parts that are unpollinated. What you do not, you do not, there's no males, that's what the no male sign is. No pollinated, pollinated would be a weed. Um, you do not grow a male plant because a male plant would be a source of pollen that then could move to a female plant and then pollinate and then you get seeds. You want a, a, a female plant that is continuously growing, tr wanting to be pollinated and creating this huge uh, uh, grossly in, enlarged female flower that's never pollinated. Uh, it's called the, the sensimilla. It's uh, the bud. This is what you harvest. You harvest the bud, and that's the female flower. So no males would be involved. Nor, so that's one of the reasons you don't grow it from seed, too. If you grow it from seed, you know, half of them are going to be males, and, and you'd have to cull them all out. Uh, so there's, there's several reasons why it's generally propagated by cuttings. Now, there are problems 
there are real problems with this. There's a lot of abiotic disorders, uh, nutrient, things like that. Uh, the, you know, no standardization and fertilization uh, work has been done on, on this crop. Uh, couple pathogens, these are the main things that show up uh, that I have seen. Now, I, I have not seen a lot of this, uh, of this crop. I, I do this kind of incidentally. Um, and but, oh, let me go back to this, by the way. The, the leaves, people don't smoke the leaves anymore. You know, I've got my, my source un, to be unnamed, you know, uh, you know, tells me, Dad, nobody smokes the leaves anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff will kill you. Um, so the leaves, you know, are, are generally used as, as tinctures or, or they'll, um, they'll extract uh, the compounds out of it, maybe put it into edibles or something like that, but you don't, you don't smoke. Nobody smokes the leaves. That stuff will kill you. Uh, it's all buds. Anyway, that's what's sold. Um, anyway, uh, two pathogens would be a powdery mildew and the pythium root rots. Arthropods, it's, it's mostly mites, uh, uh, interesting aphid issue I've seen. And again, this is by no means exhaustive. I just do the, again, I, I, I don't do this part of my regular job. This happens uh, uh, when every once in a while people bring me things and I'll, I'll see it on my off time, uh, not when I'm working. But these would be the main things we do see. So to uh, go through these, two-spotted spider mite, th that is the most consistent pest that can kill you. I mean, you can lose your crop. I've seen crops that have been utterly devastated by two-spotted spider mite. Uh, if that gets in and is you know, un uncontrolled with the high temperatures and uh, in these conditions, they can just uh, cr go through the roof in a very short period of time and, uh, and, and wipe out the crop. Uh, and interesting, the one, to me, the most interesting bug that I've seen so far is this hemp russet mite, which has been almost entirely unstudied. Uh, first described in the 60s from, uh, a, uh, from Europe, uh, but I, I can find zero biology on this. Um, you know, mostly what we are assuming is it might be like another leaf uh, vagrant uh, russet mite, like tomato russet mite, which has been studied. But uh, this, this will also build enormous numbers and uh, 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 can, can uh, uh, kill the flower buds and, and does. People lose crops due to hemp russet mite. And this is a tiny, I mean, if you don't know anything about aerified mites, and you do know about spider mites. The aerified mites make a, a spider mite look like an elephant. I mean, these are tiny little, little things. Uh, but they are, it's a real, totally unstudied creature that needs work on. Um, rice root aphid, holy, I see, I saw aphids in, on the roots in hydroponic of some weird aphid. And I see aphids on the leaves and, and lots of things. What the heck is, it's rice root aphid. I'd never worked with rice. Where the heck did rice root aphid even come from? But I've seen it in a lot of places. Uh, and that is the primary aphid that is, is associated with the crop. And it is feeding on the, on the roots. You don't, I'd never see it feeding above ground. That, that there is actually on rice on the left. But they're feeding on the roots and that's in a hydroponic system there. Um, fungus nets, of course. Most of these are grown, uh, if they're grown in a pot culture, they are grown in a high organic matter pot culture. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of, uh, and uh, fungus nets often can thrive if it's, particularly if it's kept suitably moist. So a lot of fungus nets. Whether they affect the crop or not is, I think, pretty debatable. Uh, they're, they're probably uh, limiting their feeding entirely to the decomposing organic matter in the potting mix. But they can be a huge number and certainly cause concern when they see them. But whether or not it's damaging the crop is unresolved. And then the mildew is a powdery mildew of cannabis. Uh, you know, there's lots of different mildews. This is the mildew on this crop. Um, and uh, the other, I think it goes to, um, there's a fairly narrow host range. I think it goes to hops also. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's a very different mildew than any of the other mildews. So, you know. You could have mildew on your lilac, and that's not it. Um, and then uh, pythium root rots. And the pythium root rots uh, have, have mostly been an issue with this um, uh, uh, growing them on these uh, uh, hydroponic systems. Uh, now, pythium is a very ubiquitous pathogen of, of roots. And, and uh, if it does get in a, a hydroponic system, uh, it has a highly resistant stage. And you can never really get rid of it. And, and uh, they will decay the roots and the plants just don't grow and, and then you ruin. You just throw the whole thing away. You're not, you know, anyway, why anybody grows hydroponic marijuana is beyond me, other than it's cool to be, grow things hydroponically. Now, um, so getting back to uh, uh, 
some of the laws and the, some of the management. Uh, so so one, of the, one of the things we would use you know, as a tool for managing these things would be pesticides uh, if, if needed. And, and, uh, but what is the situation with uh, pesticides uh, for this crop? Well, since marijuana is classified as a Schedule I drug, no federal agency will recognize the crop for any purpose. It is under federal law. It is strictly an illegal crop. That's it. No, no, nothing, nothing else. End of, end of discussion. Therefore, no federal agency will recognize it, including the EPA, which is the agency that regulates pesticides. So in order for a pesticide to be allowed to be used on a crop, you may or may not know, but it has to be, it has to, the label has to allow it to be used on that site. It has to be used, you know, you can't use a pesticides on soybeans if it doesn't say soybeans on the label. And EPA will not establish a site for this. They don't exist, it doesn't exist, so no site. No site, that means no pesticides are allowed. Um, uh, now, so, so, so what that means, if, if, if something gets registered, if it ever has an EPA number, if you have registered for it, and this could be insecticidal soap, this could be neem, this could be pyrethrins, organic stuff, doesn't matter. If it has an EPA reg number and you use it on the crop, it is illegal because that is not on the, on the, on the crop site. Uh, the crop site isn't indicated because there is no crop site because they won't accept a crop site. Um, so you put an EPA registration number, it's immediately an illegal pesticide, no matter what we're talking about. So this, there, another good, if you ever get into this, another good book to read is Catch-22. Uh, this is another background. <laughs> read that chapter in, in uh, uh, the on Botany of Desire. Read, read Catch-22. I mean, it's, it's just so a problematic solution for which the only solution is denied by circumstance inherent in this problem of by, or by a rule. It's just, you know, all these things, you, you just keep, it's, it's just crazy. It's just the whole system is so crazy because nobody will move on this because state is working one way and, and, and there's a lot of, Anyway, there's a lot of disincentives in the current system to uh, achieve optimum pest management on this crop. Anyway, personally, I think if the EPA were to work, uh, were to uh, um, decide to, to participate in, in this whole process and recognize this crop, the easiest thing for it to do would be to recognize it as fitting into uh, Category 19 of uh, uh, crop, which is indoor-grown herbs and spices. It's another indoor-grown herb and spice. You just say cannabis is another indoor-grown herb and spice. And, and that is about the most restrictive crop category we have in terms of what we can use. Essentially, you know, they're all very short persisting. Almost all of them are allowed in certified organic production, but things like soaps and oils and things like that. Just, just say it's, an, just add it to the, you know, there's a long list of crops that are in category. Just put one more, one more word in that long list. It'd solve this problem. But they won't, and they won't until there's political will to do that at the federal level. Um, in the absence of this, actually then all the, the only things that are actually technically legal to use on this crop would be uh, things that are not uh, regulated by, um, as, as pesticides um, under federal law, and that would include things like uh, nematodes, predatory mites, insect predators, parasitoids. These are not regulated as pesticides. Uh, and any of the 25B minimum risk, these are usually botanical products that uh, you don't even need to register, but it'd be like cinnamon oil or thyme oil or something like that. Now, whether or not they work is another issue, but they could be used legally because they're not, they don't require federal registration. Now, a lot of unfortunate things happen in the absence of uh, federal decision to allow this crop to be uh, accepted at even a basic level. I mean, again, we, uh, I, I think I've already mentioned this, but we can't, as CSU employees, we have been told we cannot talk about this. I cannot talk about, no, you, you, a sample comes into a county office, they have to turn them away. We have been told multiple times by the lawyers at CSU, we cannot ever, as CSU employees, talk about this because we accept federal money. So, public's on their own, absolutely on their own. We have, we have to wash our hands of it, and uh, bad things happen when that uh, occurs. So we have the inability to disseminate information on diagnostics, you know, and uh, we have the inability to disseminate information on optimum 
IPM practices, or certainly to conduct research. No, certainly, you know, no way we're going to be able to conduct research. Uh, and uh, this also uh, typically uh, will result in unregulated, illegal, ineffective, and often unsafe pesticide uses. That's what happens when we leave it uh, uh, totally unregulated. It's absolutely unregulated because we refuse to regulate it because it, we pretend it doesn't exist. So as an example, this, is, this is, could be what happens. So this is a letter I got last August from a, a, a grower who thought he had mites. He thought he had, uh, he was seeing these little balls on his leaf and he uh, 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 thought these, he went on the internet and he thought they were broad mites or um, what else do you think they were? Broad mite, or cyclamen mite eggs that these, these were. Let me just tell you right now, what they were was they were natural glandular hairs on the plant. But he kept seeing these little balls on his, his plant. Um, uh, so this is what he did. I just, um, let's see, where do I start? Okay, so, so this, uh, the, he, he sent me this sample from a relatively young plant, approximately six, six weeks since it was seed, seeded. The plant is growing, but not as vigorously as it should be. Also, I have built up an incredible arsenal of miticides, which I have done research, talked to university researchers about, and read and reread labels for safety and correct usage. Despite all these treatments, I am still seeing eggs, what I believe to be cyclamen in my eggs. And again, they were not. They were plant hairs, but you know, I had to tell them that off camp. But this is what he did. So in the beginning, he germinated seeds on July 3rd, and he uh, tried a couple things, uh, uh, this BioWar, which is some soil microbes. You can buy a lot of these products. So he did that on July 11th. Um, and then he uh, did a, 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 a dunk of the whole plant with sulfur and pyrethrins. Okay, still saw eggs, started to discontinue. Okay, so that's on the, the 11th. And then on the 18th, he... he uh, uh, Went to the big, uh, big guns. He, he dunked the whole plants in Avid. Uh, then then uh, five days later, he dunked it in what's called Pylon. Dunked the whole plant in again. Uh, next, he dunked it in Sirocco, which is Avid plus Fluoromite. So it's two products. Dunked it in uh, August 6th. He dunked it in Akari. August 9th, he dunked it in Avid. August 12th, he dunked it in Magister. These are all the products that he then, these are what, now, now almost none of these products after this point are labeled for herbs and spices or even food crops. These are all products you would use that have labels for flowers in a greenhouse for mites. But this is what he was putting on. I mean, at like five days, dunking the whole plant. And, and, and uh, anyway, so that's what happens when you leave it alone. Um, now, Washington State, the other state that has uh, allowed this has done a kind of finesse that they're going to go with. The Washington State Department of Agriculture has done a, a finesse where they will allow uh, certain kinds of um, uh, insecticides to be allowed if they are insecticides that do not require a food crop tolerance. There's a lot of pesticides that don't require food crop tolerance, like pyrethrins or azadirac and things that you can use right up to harvest, but some of the biological products and things like that. So they, they say they will allow any of these. Uh, also, if it, it has directions for use on unspecified food crops, including unspecified food crops grown as bedding plants, and it's registered in the state. And they'll also allow the 24C products if they're allowed, if they're registered as pesticides in the state. Um, the net effect of this is the Washington State Department of Agriculture guidelines are essentially category 19 pesticides. They've come about it a different way. Um, so that's how they have proposed. Now, whether that's illegal, whether that's legal, or, and it probably isn't legal, but whether the federal government will challenge Washington State with these is, is still to be determined. But this would be, this would allow these as products for control on the crop. These would be the ones with the Washington finesse or, or really for uh, category 19, you could probably use a lot. So this is a mixture of uh, products both for uh, plant disease management as well as uh, 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 pat pathogens as well as uh, arthropods. Um, in Colorado, I w I mean, we're, we're not, we haven't even gone that far. Uh, it, it's, we're, we're way behind Washington, and, and our, we have made no decision yet. Uh, part of the reason is the way the law was written is the primary regulatory agency is the Department of Revenue because they are the ones who are collecting the taxes and, and uh, controlling 
uh, how this is developed and writing all the regs for that. And they haven't a clue about how production, you know, revenue, Department of Revenue people. So Department of Agriculture is pretty much out of it. They gave Department of Ag develop hemp. Okay, so that's what they're working on. And then when they get around to it, they will come up with a list of pesticides that are allowed to be used on the crop, uh, the recreational indoor crops. But they, they haven't even gotten to that. They said maybe they'll start thinking about it in May. So we have nothing. There's nothing legal. So what, do you, so, so what happens in the absence of this? So, so uh, what happens is you go to a store and you are seeing uh, products that are typically registered as pesticides but do not overtly sell them as pest control products. So you'll see neem oil that will be sold. So this is the oil from neem seed that would be sold to control powder mildew and all this. It would be an EPA registration number. You couldn't use that because that's a registered pesticide. But you sell neem oil as leaf polish and make zero claims and you can sell it. Or power wash, there's all these power wash products and they could have soap, they could have oils, they could have all sorts of stuff in it, but they're a power wash and you don't make any pest claims, but by social media, you know what they're talking about. So, or you, you, uh, some of these microbes, you, you just put them in you just sell them as a, as, a, as a tea to put in with the plants. You don't sell them as, a, as an EPA registered you know, trichoderma or something like that that you put in. You just don't say it. So you just avoid it that way. You just, I'm not selling a pesticide, I'm selling a power wash. Same product in it. Or you could go, uh, uh, option two, you use products as pesticides that are not registered as pesticides that, that for any purpose. Uh, uh, sulfur, or, or, well, that could be, that has some purpose. But sulfur fogs, you can, it, is not, it is not illegal to take elemental sulfur and put it in a, a heater and fog your old greenhouse. Now, you walk in, you'll be blinded, uh, uh, but, yeah, you can do it. It's not an illegal use. You can jack up CO2 levels to levels that will perhaps kill insects in the plant and kill you if you walk into that room. But that's not illegal because CO2 is not a pesticide. Or you can get these 25B products. So for instance, uh, one guy who's, who's making, you, you see Ed Ro Rosenthal's talking all the time about pests on pot. And uh, he's got a whole line of products. And all he is is say, this product contains ingredients listed on 25B minimum risk pesticide products. Uh, this product has not been registered by the EPA. And uh, he represents that this product qualifies for exemption of registration for EPA. So it's not even, but uh, anyway, so you get an end, end run right way. Or you just flat out ignore it and you just put on whatever you think you need to put on it, which is what also happens, as I indicated. And, and I separate these things that, you know, that are, are put on these crops as two, two things, illegal and unsafe, things that would never get registered for this crop were the EPA to allow some discussion about this. And those are the ones that bother me a lot. This is this this when if we're, if growers were using these products, that's a concern. And, and I, I I just hope there'll be a, a news story where people will go through and start doing pesticide residue analysis and break the story, you know, and find out you know 10 percent, 20 percent have got illegal pesticides that are not only illegal but unsafe. I do separate that because really anything you find neem extract on a plant, it's technically illegal probably if it came from say. Uh, a commercial product with EPA registration number. Anyway, pirate. But these ones are illegal strictly due to regulatory indecision. Anyway, I do think uh, a, a lot of things could be done very quickly uh, and uh, to make the situation a lot better. Um, I, I, I've been attracted to this just because it's a, I, I like pest management problems, and this is a wide open pest management problem with lots of. Uh, things that uh, a lot of progress could be made very quickly were we to uh, spend a little time on it. Um, you know, the powdery mildew, again, I'm no plant pathologist, but uh, there are lots of good options that could be promoted on this. And by the way, um, I've done a little stab at this. Here's my, here's, here's my publication called Pest Management of Indoor Grown Medical Marijuana in Colorado, which is only available through my home email if you want this, okay? But if you bug books direct at Yahoo. So uh, if you want to see what it looks like. So this is, I've got to update this, but this is kind of, that's, that would be a kind of a little interim ongoing publication that we, we do on the site. Anyway, powdery mildew, uh, lots of things, uh, there's lots of options. This is going to be, you, you can exclude the uh, causal organisms uh, uh, by not bringing, bringing it in. Uh, on, on cuttings that have the powdery mildew, uh, oils, desiccants, there's a lot of uh, things that people use for powdery mildews. 
biological control agents, improving uh, air circulation, but you know, again, oils, lots of oils. Uh, people have used oils for um, uh, powdery mildew. These could be the uh, paraffinic oils the, uh, that we use for lots of different uses that are petroleum derived, or they, uh, such as this one too. This is a, one that's got very good labeling on food crops. Uh, or it could be the ones from canola seed or, or neem seed. All, the, all these oils probably function pretty much the same for powdery mildew control. Plus there's uh, potassium bicarbonate. You could use just baking soda and that would be not a pesticide. So you could, you could do that. Uh, but this is a pesticide, so you couldn't do that legally. But that, of course, works. Um, and then there are biological controls that are, are quite commonly available and sold. Uh, Bacillus subtilis is, uh, you see this a lot in these shops that are catering to this. It's a biocontrol agent uh, that controls powdery mildews. And, and, and air. Uh, powdery mildew uh, would tend to occur in areas where air pools and, uh, uh, and, and sometimes there's a lot of fan action. And, and one of the, I'll try to make this point again, but, but one of the things that could be done with, to solve a lot of these problems is just if you could discuss with the grower how to set up the room in order to avoid some of the pest problems or to minimize the problems. So just like fan placement in this case and how you put your plants around so you get good air circulation could have a huge impact on this, this problem. Fans will affect which way mites are blowing off plants onto other mites, onto other plants. Uh, if you could talk about it, you could, you could bring up these points so that they would then maybe think about arranging room designs so that pest problems are, are reduced rather than, uh, in some cases, uh, worsened. Uh, the pythium root rots, well, you know, big thing, thing there is just uh, try to, you know, if you're going to grow hydroponically, you make sure you never introduce pythium into the system. You know, one infected plant uh, introduces in the system and, and you're, you're, you're ruined. Avoid hydroponic production, avoid producing soil conditions favorable for growth, but there are a lot of good biological control organisms if you grow the pot culture the, in, the, in the little bags or in the pot uh, with drip. I mean, there's, there's wonderful biocontrol agents for pythium out there. They are registered as pesticides. Um, you know, things like root shield or plant shield, the trichoderma, or actually you could also use uh, uh, Bacillus subtilis for that purpose as well. I mean, these are, these are microbes used for, but they are also pesticides. They are registered, they got an EPA registration number. You can't use that because it's a pesticide. If they didn't register this, if they just sold that as, you know, as tea, as a compost tea with trichoderma and made zero claims, you can sell it and that's what they're doing. But if you make claims, there is no insect. So people, people are developing pesticide products right now for this market and uh, sometimes have been asked you know, to, to help in terms of evaluating them or, or how to set up trials. I, I don't evaluate them, but I tell them how they could evaluate them. And, but I tell them, don't get it registered. As soon as you're registered, you can't, you can't sell it. So just you know, see if it works and then just get social media out and say, this, this actually works. There's no incentive to go through the process we have set up to ensure that what we use on our crops is safe and effective with this crop until, until we take it out in the open and talk about it. Fungus gnats, piece of cake, no, no real problems. We can control that legally with products that we have now. Um, use a growing meat that doesn't favor development of fungus gnats, we should look at that a little more. There's you know, some, some kind of potting media has much more susceptible fungus gnats. Traps, azadract, and drenches. Now, this would not be technically legal, but there are some uh, other things we could use for, for that. Uh, again, they're mostly feeding on fungi, so you reduce the decaying, you reduce the amount of, of uh, decaying plant matter, and uh, the kind of uh, potting mix you have could affect that. You can trap them, or you can uh, maybe use azadractin if it were to be allowed, um, just not, uh, it is not yet. Or there's nematodes. These are not reg these are not uh, restricted. You could you could use Steinonema feltii, which does work uh, on fungus gnat larvae in the in the soil. A um, lot of different products. Or you could maybe you know we, they could start working with some of these soil mites that you can buy in greenhouses, and they could enrich the soil with say Hypoaspis uh, is a soil predator mite, and they would take. So I mean that's that's a solvable problem with existing products. Israelensis strain too, you, BT Israelensis strain is uh, another thing that you may be aware of works on fungus gnats. It also works on mosquitoes. 
uh, you can't find a product that would be used, used for fungus gnats and marijuana. So what you find, you go to the store, the, 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 the caters to these people, and they'll be, you know, this is for uh, powdery mildew. Here's some mosquito bits, which is BTI, but sold for mosquitoes, and it's what they'll do is they'll incorporate it into the soil. They'll use it for fungus gnat control. Just nobody talks to me. Just, oh, you want to control some mosquitoes in your tomato plants? Uh, yeah, sure. Here, this is the product to use. I mean, you just, you know, just get around it. It's just so silly. Anyway, um, for the rice root aphid, this would be interesting. I don't know what to say, how this will work. I, I, I was so surprised to see rice root aphid show up. Uh, particularly in, well, it's, it's in, in any kind of production. First of all, I'm not sure how it gets in. So um, in exclusion certainly has got to be you know, something to be considered. It, uh, presumably it either comes in on these cuttings, maybe incidentally people are carrying it on their, their person, or uh, if, they, if they had vents, they could presumably come in through vents in the, in the summertime. But uh, excluding it is, is the way to go. Azodiractin drenches, I don't know. You know. I've never seen anybody try to work on a, on a root aphid. Uh, in a situation like this. Maybe azadiractin will work, uh, maybe some biocontrol agents. Uh, uh, so azadiractin, maybe the hypoaspis miles, they might, that might work on it. I don't know. That would be a fun project. How do you get rid of root aphids in a, in a greenhouse? Uh, there are these uh, uh, enema pathogenic fungi, Metarhizium anisopli or Boveria bassiana. Presumably you could try that. That would be a fun project. That would be a great project. Um, anyway. Uh, the hemp russet mite, this is the one that really gets me, because again, this is, this is a major pest, and there is a huge amount of, of uh, uh, um, mythology about this, because there's absolutely nothing done on the biology. I mean, this would be just, first thing I would, I would want somebody to do is figure out the basic outline of the biology of this insect, you know, number of generations, and also things related to management. How do you, how does it get around? What are its alternate hosts, if any? The, Literature says that there are no other alternate hosts than cannabis. How long can it survive off the host? I mean, these all have things that you could then incorporate into pest management plans if you knew this. Well, we don't know anything. You know, right now, these things have got a mythological ability to persist for years off the host. And you come back in the room, and you know, that room, once it has hemp russet mite, can never be used, which is, can't be right. I mean, these tomato russet mite dies in a week off the host. Why would this last forever? You go to the internet, it's, it's, because uh, they don't understand it. Nobody knows it, They're, and there's nothing on it. There's no, no. two-spotted spider mite, again, this is the killer, number one pest of the crop. And uh, um, uh, so, so this is, what you, so this is the kind of in, in, information you get. This is, uh, uh, you, you just go on the internet and you find, you know, look for hemp russet mite control or spider mite control, and this is, this is what you, uh, I get, this is one thing on, Consider the situation, you spray your chemicals, the mites may not die right away depending on the mode of action. What happens next is the mites panic and start to lay eggs like crazy. Before you know it, the mites have become twice as bad as before you hit them. The best method to control this pest is to switch your mode of attack each and every day. Never spray them with the same stuff twice in a row if you choose a chemical approach. You want to use neem oil along with as many other forms of phytocides as you can get your hands on. Let's go for it. That's, 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 that's the advice you get on the internet. That's all we got. We don't have anything else. The, the uh, land grant institution has kept out of this. So, exclusion to uh, oils, maybe azadiractin, predatory mites, I'll, I'll talk to, but excluding, I mean, a lot of these are excluding. I mean, if, if we could tell people some basic, you know, you know the, how this is getting in and maybe to set up quarantine areas and have your new plants come in in one room and before you move them in another, you make sure there's zero bugs on those. I mean, just simple stuff like that. Uh, she'd probably kill me for saying this in, in this way, but in the words of Nancy Reagan, you just say no to uh, say spider mites on, on hemp um, uh, or hemp russet mite or any of these things. I mean, if you could talk about it, y you could probably avoid almost all of the, the uh, uh, situations that ultimately go bad. Um, Cuttings, if they're used, must be thoroughly disinfested. I mean, people are carrying these in. I mean, hemp russet mites are so tiny. Even spider mites are quite tiny. They are being brought in without people knowing. They may be being brought in on their hands because they were in another grove just before that. Or These methods of how they're getting in have got to be identified and then stopped. And then the problem's over. No, no mites in the, in the grove, no problem. 
you don't need to use pesticides. Or, or you know, this, this is one where you've got little plants up here and, and mature plants here, and the wind's blowing everything around, and they're just steamrolling, boom, boom, but they're just continuously, no breaks. You know, you could, you could plan a grow so you had, you know, this, it, this is growing here, and then the next one's separated from that, and they don't cross-contaminate each other. But there's no thought to that because you can't, that's not in people's plans. They're thinking about other things. They don't have a clue about pests. They're not getting good information about it. You could monitor to, uh, uh, you should teach, be able to teach people how to pick them up. You know, so here's, you know, you look for spider mites, and you, there's lots of ways you monitor spider mites, but you know, you're looking for the little flecks. Only you want to get it before it gets that bad. You want to get it, you want people to be able to get an eye so they can catch it like that. Then you could maybe knock it back with oils. A little bit of training, you could teach, you, you could catch this early, even if, it, even if it did get in, you could get it early, just, to, but, but you got to be able to talk to them about how you look for this, but you can't do that. So, so, so monitoring, basic fundamental of, of IPM is not allowed because we can't talk about it. There are predators. I don't know how this will fit in, how the predators will fit in. There are predators, of course, that feed on spider mites, lots of different things. Um, what you can generally purchase are either minute pirate bugs, anthocord bugs, or generally uh, uh, predatory mites of various kinds. I don't know how this is going to work, how predatory mites would work on this crop. That is a, that's definitely something that needs to be looked at. Um, uh, they can be used very effectively on, on many other indoor crops. The things I'm worried about with this crop is the high temperatures, the aridity, at least in our area, these are very arid. Uh, I don't know how arid the surface is, but, uh, and uh, the fact that you uh, have almost uh, 24 hours day length for a while, and then boom, you got zero, and then these, these insects, their photopere gets so screwed up that maybe they'll just pretend it's winter or something. And, stop reproducing. I don't know. A lot of, there'll be interesting projects you could do with that. Um, but there are some. These are the uh, species that are probably the most that you can buy in the commercial market that are most uh, tolerant of dry conditions uh, or most available. Unfortunately, uh, you know, some of the, it, it may, may work here, but it, I don't think it will work where we are. So for instance, this is the most common predatory mite that's on the market, cheapest. General, it, it feeds very heavily on, on spider mites under the right conditions. Uh, yeah, but the right conditions are optimally 80 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, relative humidity greater than 50 percent. Well, our relative humidity is 30 percent. I mean, rarely does it get to 50 percent. It's you know, I don't know what it is on the leaf surface when there is sodium lamps that are burning right on top of it, probably very dry. The one that you find in the markets for that is most tolerant of, of drying is this uh, Mesocelis longipes. Uh, this can tolerate the very low, the very low humidity of 40 percent, which we don't even get when the temperature is 70, 70, but increasing humidity as temperature rises. And again, these, these plants are being grown at closer to 90 degrees, probably, Fahrenheit. So I don't know how this will work. But if they could work, probably the best way would be to develop some sort of bank or plant system. Bank or plant system probably makes the easiest thing would be uh, two spots. The, the pest, Banks grass mite, is a really easy one to culture on grasses. The Banks grass mite wouldn't go to cannabis, it's just a grass pest. And you develop a system, one plant growing, that'd be the cannabis on the left, and the right would be, say, you know, corn or something. And then uh, introduce the predator, develop on the Banks grass mite, spill over onto the other one. That, so I think there's a lot of potential use of a banker plant system uh, if we could get mites to work. Anyway, anyway, summary on this is cultivated cannabis has, has several Pest problems, some of which can destroy the crop. They are very real problems. They can and do destroy the crop. Present pest management practices are not guided by science. They are guided by internet gossip. Uh, pres present pest management practice on the crop is often misguided, ineffective, and on occasion hazardous because of inappropriate use of pesticides um, or CO2 at human levels or sulfur fogs or things that people are doing. Federal obstructions prevent, pr pr uh, produce the biggest impediments and the biggest challenges to improving IPM. Um, the ability to discuss IPM with growers would have immense value. Just that, if we could just talk to them, if I could just talk to them as, you know, and develop maybe some recommendations that we could put out through CSU, that would have immense immediate value. We would, we would go 80% of the problem would be solved if we could talk about it, just like that. 
Resolution of pesticide registration issues is needed to produce effective IPM strategies. That's going to take longer. We, we will need Congress to make changes in the law, and Congress can't make changes in anything. So um, uh, it hasn't for four years. But anyway, but uh, rapid progress in, in developing optimal IPM practices can be expected following the release of these federal instructions. I mean, it's wide open. There's, there's tremendous possibilities, but I don't know. So, big, so is it. So, what are questions? I'm trying to get lots of questions. Yeah, Betsy. With Whitney, it sounds like you've got a career plan after you retire. I don't want to do this. I, I mean, I, it'd be totally, I could be totally sucked up into this. I, I just think there's really, I want to work on the hemp russet mite. I have never grown this maybe since college, but I haven't grown this, uh, but I'm growing a few plants just so I can grow hemp russet mite. I'm not growing for myself, but I, that's, that's, that'd be a cool thing. I mean, I, I, no, I'm not, it's not, I like what I'm doing, but yeah, somebody else could do it, but I, I, I'd like, you know, to be involved. It's, it's a fun, pro it's just a fun project. I like fun projects, so it's a fun project. Yeah? You made a no, really interesting comment at the start that hemp grown for fiber um, likely won't be grown in Colorado well, just say so it can't be done economically. I mean, you, you, clean, you, it could grow it here much easier than we could grow it once it was allowed. I mean, we'll be since we're the only game in town, people will grow it in, in Colorado. But one, one, one thing I can kind of remember from Alvin's book is that um, breeders have done an incredible job of taking this plant that was huge in its sort of natural setting and growing it effectively in a indoor. Yeah. A much plant. Yeah. I'm wondering if, uh, with, with the interaction you've had with this industry, now that it's legal in Colorado, is there interest in uh, taking it outside? Well, the hemp is growing outside. I mean, the, the that would take no. They're, no they're, they're trying to figure out how to make this work the way they got it. If, if, if they get all this stuff figured out, then, you know, they might change it in the future. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, they, it, it allows you to control it. You have you 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 have to. These grows have got to be uh, uh, they they um, have got to be you know, locked. You can't get in it. Uh, they've got cameras and, and security and all sorts of things, and you can't have that outside. And and you have to account for every gram you produce. You know, and this has got and you would lose that outside. This for the near future, the recreational cannabis. And the medical caravan is only going to be grown as an indoor crop in our state, because other than that, it becomes even way too difficult to control its production and uh, use, just to, to how it's distributed. So we have to deal with it, but but that's okay. You, I mean, why why do you need to grow it outside? I mean, you could grow, you know, in this room, you could grow, you know, fifteen fifty thousand dollars worth easy. Why you need to grow outside? It seems to, you point out that it's very. Intensive energy. Yeah, but you can grow two crops a year. You can grow, yeah. You can get you can get in and out certainly in four four months. You just jack it up and turn the lights off, and then it goes into flower. And then you take it out and do it again. So two crops a year. That might make it more. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Hemp is going to grow outdoors. That, but that will be you know that's a big fiber crop and. And again, the, the, the niches in Colorado will grow it for seed. There'll be a little hemp. I don't know how they're going to process the fibers, but if, it, if they're really serious about it as a, as a fiber crop, then places that actually can grow plants will be where they'll grow it, not Colorado. Yeah? I know you can't do it at the university, but are there private people now that are doing genetics to try to solve some of these problems? Probably not. Not the pest stuff. I mean, there's people who've been doing genetics work. As as uh, was just mentioned in that in the Michael Pollan book, talks so, you know the the brightest minds in in uh, genetics in breeding, you know, went to this crop <laughs> in, over the last 30 years uh, under the table to grow these amazing strains and to change this into a totally different plant. So, but but the pest part, and this is all I feel comfortable talking about. The pest part remains, you know, a mystery. I mean, people know how to grow plants, but people, very bright people who know how to grow plants, a mite is a total mystery to them, and much less a powdery mildew. I mean, God, so this is stuff we can do better. You know, this is stuff we have to do, get involved in, because they're going to screw it up. Yeah? Have the Europeans made any contributions to uh, IPM for this? I don't think so. I mean, it, I mean it's, it's essentially, I mean, it, you can, it's not, 
it, it, it's the only place I think it's for sale is Netherlands, and I don't think I've never seen any publications on it. On, on it. Yeah. It's still technically kind of be, it's it's in another world still over there. Yeah. Are the pest control problems um, that you mentioned unique to growing it indoors, or would the same um, issues be present in industrial hemp, which, as you mentioned? No, I don't think. I, I think it'd be totally different. I don't. I, I I'd be really surprised if you had mite problems on uh, sp at least two spots spider mite on outdoor crop. You might. I don't know what hemp russet mite will do. I mean, it was first found outdoors, but um, I don't know. I mean, there's natural enemies. There's all sorts of other stuff. Affecting it outdoors, I, I, I don't. You know, you, you might get European corn borer in it until, you know, uh, you know, it go, European corn borer goes in the stock. I mean, yeah, yeah. Some closely related things like hops. Yeah, yeah. European, they'll go into anything. Yeah, but uh, it won't be. No, I, I, I mean, there's lots of. There, you, I mean, there's books on all the insects and cannabis, and most of those do, deal with things that they found at outdoor crops throughout the world. There's a huge list of things you can find on the on the plant, um, but uh, whether they're real pests, I, I don't think hemp's going to have real problems. Um, but indoor, yeah, you do. So that's that's. Really. Yep. Yeah.